I want you to be the very best version of yourself that you can be. I hold a baby all day, and then nighttime rolls around, and I'm supposed to just switch gears. I honestly think motherhood can't be defined. I don't think there's just one single definition. Today on Context, the complexities and miracles of the strongest bond we'll ever have. Without our mothers, we wouldn't be here, of course. But are the rapidly changing roles of womanhood also changing our ideas and expectations about motherhood? What does it mean to be a mother or a woman in 2018? That is just ahead on our Mom's Day special. But first, we turn our attention to Mother Nature and parts of our country that are in the throes of massive flooding not seen in decades. New Brunswick has an unprecedented amount of water right now. Record-breaking floods have forced 1,100 people out of their homes. Still, some are refusing to leave as water levels rise. Now, the largest public health concern there is around murky, contaminated water. That could make people sick. On the other side of the country, 17 communities in British Columbia are facing states of emergency right now. The Okanagan and Caribou regions have been inundated with water. Nearly 600 homes have been evacuated. I'm Molly Thomas. I'm Sheldon Neal. And this is Context. Sheldon Neal speaks with an ER doctor and mom of four who took her children around the globe. Dr. Rose Meter believes that being a Christian means meeting people where they're at. Her podcast, Intersection, connects people through authentic stories of faith. And just what do today's young women want? A group of millennials discuss the miracles, blessings, and obstacles of motherhood and whether kids and marriage are what they desire for their lives. And Context correspondent Sheridan Sanders joins us from Rome to give us some insights on modern motherhood and God's love for women throughout the ages in the church. And what are some of the greatest challenges facing families today? The director of Safe Families Canada gives us insight on the state of the Canadian family and how they're ensuring every at-risk kid gets their best start in life. And being a woman in 2018, Simone Holligan, a researcher on family relations, joins us to talk about how society's view of womanhood is constantly changing. Now playtime is a formal thing, and it's killing me. You've got to establish whether this other mother is staying or going. Do not let her leave without telling you what time she's coming back. Because otherwise, you're basically adopting her kid. <laughs> well, every generation has a baby boom, and the millennial generation is no different. For women, especially though it looks different than ever before, we go now to Molly Thomas, who's with a group of women to talk about being a mom in 2018. Well, welcome to my home, Sheldon. We have uh, millennial moms and moms possibly to be, maybe not be, I guess we'll have to find out. Uh, and Max, the star of the show, of course, and Max. Uh, Jesse, let's start with you. Um, you know, you and your husband actually didn't know if you're going to have kids. Uh, you made a change. Uh, you have an 11 month old. Yes, we do. We have an 11 month old son. Um, but actually, this is before we even became a couple. We were talking about our future plans if they were aligned, and the topic of kids came up. And he wasn't sure because he leads a global um, organization. He travels a lot, and he wondered if he could do that and be a good dad. And so we prayed about it. We asked God about it separately, and I felt so confirmed. This is for me. God wants me to be a mom. And separately, God spoke to him, and he felt that he should be a father. And so mm -hmm. we were. We did start our relationship, and we do have a son. So I'm so <laughs> glad that that worked out. <laughs> <laughs> you look very happy. Yes. So congratulations. Yes, thank you. Uh, the Pew Research Center has said that millennials uh, do want to have kids. They're just having them later, mm -hmm. but they do feel that kids are actually central to their identity. Mindy, one of the reasons that they're having them later is because it's expensive. In places like Toronto, it costs sure. a lot to live here. I mean, did that factor into having Max, when to have Max? For sure. So yeah, growing up living in Toronto, I've seen that it's expensive. Um, so when Aaron, my husband and I were considering having because we were living downtown at the time, but he went back to school. Mm -hmm. And going from double to single income, that was a huge factor. So. In that case, we waited until a certain timing in his school year, and we prayed about it, and it wasn't a, to our timing exactly, but it actually ended up really perfect because it coincided right when we graduated. 
little Max came. <laughs> <laughs> we moved north York, not that north of York, <laughs> North York, a little cheaper than downtown, and um, now we have more space, and um, we have baby Max now. Well, there you go. Uh, Victoria, we are the most educated uh, group of women uh, from any other generation. I know you have a master's degree behind you. How do your career aspirations, I mean, fit into, you're not a mom yet, yeah. right? <laughs> uh, but how does it fit into long-term planning? Um, a lot. I think for me, I've invested a lot in myself with my master's and with my education. And I have certain goals that I want to meet in my career before I start having a family. Mm -hmm. And also, I'm in Canada on a visa, so that kind of plays into it too is do I want to stay in Canada, do I want to go somewhere else, if I want to stay here, what do I need to do to be able to do that? So there's sort of logistical things that are kind of stopping me from taking that next step so far. For sure, and I, I think, you know, I'm 31, I think in my mind I'm 20 most of the time, <laughs> but you I'm 31, well, you know, I'm 31 years old and sometimes I have to be reminded of that because there is, to a certain extent, a timeline if you want to have <laughs> your own kids. Um, Victoria, I want to ask because you're, you're dating interculturally, yes. right? And you've been with someone for 10 years. Um, how did, does that factor in? He's Pakistani. Do your, your, your families have a lot of pressure on you or? You know, it's really interesting. A lot of the pressure actually comes from my family. <laughs> so I'm originally from the southern part of the U.S. and my family comes from a very conservative Christian background. Yep. Um, and I was just telling you the other day, my dad, asked me about what my plans are because my brother's having a baby so yeah the pressure has actually come a lot more from my side of the family than from his which is pretty interesting um, but I've, I've made it pretty clear and they know that I'm I have career aspirations so I think they're they like to remind me that I should have kids soon but they they try not to pressure me too much <laughs> now, did you find that um, in some ways we have to be super women. You know, you have to have a career now, you have to know how to go back into the workforce, you have to at the same time hold down a household and kids. Like, is there pressure around that? I don't feel it explicitly, let's say for my family, just um, bouncing off what you said, but in thinking about going back to work, it's coming up soon, like five months. I actually did have a thought like, oh, should I just stay at home? But I don't know what, something is inside me pressuring me to go back mm -hmm. and to at least try balancing everything. And I do like my career, so I say for now I'm going to try doing the superwoman thing. I don't know how, to, I don't know how women do it. It's already intimidating just being a mom. Yeah. Jesse, you just went back. Oh, I just went back to how work. How was that yeah. going? Well, I, I'm a nurse. I worked one shift. Wow. It went well. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of the pressure, there's a lot of expectations outside and inside. Um, but for me, I think. What I, prior, what I want to do is prioritize what do I want to do well and what doesn't matter as much. So for me, I want to, um, my relationship with God, that's so important to me. My relationship with my husband, um, my son, our ministry, um, my work, I want to do those things well. Other things, maybe I'm not the best cook. That's okay. <laughs> that's not my priority. And then another thing that was so important to me is learning how to get help when you need it. And so. Um, even when I was on maternity leave, I work as well for a charity, so I got a babysitter for a few hours a week, um, and I'm so productive in those few hours, but learning how to get help, um, because we can't do everything, so yeah, that's some things that I've learned through the process. All right, 10 seconds, Mindy, best part of being a mom? Um, the look you get from your son and how loved you feel with that one look. Aww. Yeah. Jesse? I can't top that. <laughs> Really nice. Yeah. <laughs> All right, ladies, thank you for sharing a little bit. Max, thanks for being a part of our interview. When your kid is playing but doesn't want to stop playing for pee and starts to hop around like they're on hot coals, it means it's time to drop whatever you're doing and gun it to the nearest bathroom. Toddlers don't tell you until the pee is coming out. So when you see the signs, run and pray you make it. The lift name. Hold up a little boy, pretend she's a boy, so his peeper doesn't touch the edge of the bowl and he can aim. Do one of those. You can make circles if you want. Uh, I don't know about that yet, but I know the mothers at home do. All right, do you think the definition of motherhood has changed? Sheldon Neal spoke with some insightful people along the lakeshore to find out what they think about motherhood, womanhood, and its ever-changing roles and expectations. I honestly think motherhood can't be defined. I don't think there's just one single definition. Motherhood means caring, loving, giving, 
just being everything you can to your family and, and training, teaching. I think it's a chance for me to make up for all the times I'm not so great with my mom and to show her that I do actually love her a lot. I guess appreciating like probably one of the people who makes the most sacrifices for us, gives up everything in their lives for our well-being. You were saying that you're not necessarily a mom, but you're a universal mom. Is it? Could you give us a little picture of that? Well, for instance, if I see a little child and I see them parted from their mother, and then I'll keep an eye on them and just and just make sure that they connect again. Yeah, and I just feel, I don't know, I just feel that that's kind of my thing to do. I think that a motherly role nowadays, it doesn't just mean um, like it's your child, you're being a mother to your child. I think it can mean it can be directed towards other people, not just the child that you birthed, per se. Motherhood and womanhood are intrinsically connected. Simone Holligan focuses on families through her work at Waterloo University. That's just the hand. Flooding is devastating parts of Canada. From BC to the Maritimes, scientists say record flooding is indicative of the new norm and Canadians must adapt to a changing environment. A call to help our fellow Canadians coping through Mother Nature's wrath, coming soon on Context. Once again, our Context correspondent Sheridan Sanders is here joining us from Rome. Sheridan, good to see you. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Well, a perfect quote for today's show is from Mother Teresa, who said, God calls on all women to shower their motherhood on humankind. I, I wonder, what is the significance of God choosing to enter the world through the womb of a woman? Well, I think that's such a beautiful and profound statement because what we see is God is not uh, entering the world through a powerful position, but rather, as we all do, from a place of vulnerability and fragility. And he fully takes on our human experience. And I think that that shows the intimacy with which God loves us and joins us in our, in our journey. Wow, thinking of Jesus' love for women, how do you think this still complicates the world today? Well, you know, I, you know, Jesus was actually quite countercultural. When you look at the socio standing of women uh, during his time, um, Jesus is quite different from what is expected. He treats women with a profound sense of dignity and respect. And what's interesting is that he always looks at them in a way where he sees them as people who, um, as part of his mission. He invites them into his greater mission. And um, I, th I think that that's a, a great example and a challenge for us today. On this Mother's Day special, is respect for mothers and in fact women in the Christian religion an important cornerstone? Oh, absolutely. I mean, what we see is that when God first begins his he self, uh, begins salvation history, he asks Mary if she will participate, if she will say yes to bearing this child. And she doesn't know what's involved in it, but she becomes the exemplar of all good Christians in that she says yes and she goes on faith. But he asks her. He doesn't just make it happen. So he, he sees her as part of his mission. And then later on, the first person to witness the resurrection is another woman. It's Mary Magdalene. And, she, and in both mo those moments in time, we see that women are entrusted with this incredible, um, like vulnerable, mm -hmm. but precious message mm -hmm. for the world. So, so we see that God takes women very seriously and has a profound, um, takes much joy in them and has a profound sense of their dignity. Wow. Thank you, Sheridan, for taking the time to join us today. Oh, you're always welcome. That was Context Sheridan Sanders, who joined us from Rome. And joining us now is Simone Holligan, behavioral scientist, writer, and consultant who focuses on public health. Uh, you know, Simone, our team has been debating when we were talking about the subject, you know, the words motherhood and womanhood. I mean, can we actually separate the two? Uh, I don't think you can. So I, I really view womanhood as sort of a larger process that about half of the world's population journeys through life. And motherhood is sort of a sub-process of this larger process um, where women choose to become mothers or are able to become mothers or play mothering roles in uh, you know, young people's lives. 
Mm -hmm. Simone, I think the challenge for anyone that does choose, you know, that sub process to be a mom uh, right now is to be super mom in some ways, right? Have a job, have a life, have a career, have kids, hold down the household. Mm -hmm. um, is there any research that you've done that shows us that we're in a better place in 2018 juggling all of these things than we were maybe 50 years ago? So what we're seeing right now in terms of um, in terms of women having this sort of overload or they're, they're reaching their capacity and becoming in this super mom role. Uh, what's really happening is that uh, we're, we're moving uh, past this sort of the older generations of the dichotomy. So you either had to be a, a mother and a wife or an individual and a citizen. So really playing, you know, having a role, major roles in the home or outside of the home. And what we're seeing in women today is that they can choose, you know, uh, how much they want to engage within the home and outside of the home. And so in, instead of these dichotomies, so mother or wife versus individual citizen, you're having uh, women being able to choose along this continuum, these continuums of, you know, I can be both mother, wife, um, as I choose to be, I could be both individual, citizen, you know, playing a role in, in uh, my community, in the business, mm -hmm. um, in education. And um, there's sort of this, this choosing. So if you think of, of um, in terms of behavioral sciences, um, we look at it as um, too much choice. Actually, too much choice actually inhibits us making decisions and, and sort of regretting the decisions we've made. And an easy example is um, in looking at a, a menu within a restaurant. So sometimes when there are too many options to customize your meal, you sort of get, you sort of get confused. And you're like, well, what should I really be having here? And then when you make a choice, you're, you actually regret, you know, that choice. You actually think, oh, you should have, um, you know, chose children something different for your meal. And so what we're having is in women today, they're sort of wrestling with, you know, am I spending too much time at work? Um, you know, should I be spending more time at home uh, with my kids? Um, should I be spending more time with them reading, doing their homework, um, going out to play, or should I climb the corporate ladder? Right. And so that's that sense of, of that comparison and uh, a continuum instead of the dichotomy. So, so choosing, you know, the degree to which they're going to engage both inside and outside the home sure. is um, what women are juggling with today. For sure. But part of that choice, you know, also relies on supports to a certain extent. And I, you know, as I'm looking at the statistics, more than 1.2 million uh, single moms are in our country. I know that single fathers are on the rise in Canada too. I mean, what is your advice to people that are stepping into two roles at this point in time? Yes, and, and those numbers are staggering. And for me, what I'd have to say is that it's unfortunate that a lot of the burden is on, on single parents. And so I would say that, uh, I, I would say they don't have to expect to be able to do it all. And so my own research really looks at uh, uh, developing resilience in individuals. And so even though single parent or single mom is sort of this, this uh, negative label, um, I really look at how how individuals can leverage assets and resources um, at their disposal to sort of bring about normative and positive outcomes. Mm. And so in, in that sense, it would be normative and positive outcomes in, in their kids' development. And so for a single parent, that could mean leveraging uh, uh, assets within the family, within the community setting. It could be practices at, at work with flexible schedules, or having uh, access to to after school programs, or if, or financially assisting with you know meals for special occasions, say Thanksgiving for example. But I, I would I would go away from you know putting all the burden on on single parents and and really we need to um, get behind them and provide support at the at the individual level and the community level and also um, governmental level you know can really provide support for the single parents absolutely and we have an interview actually coming up with an organization in Canada doing just that Simone Holligan behavioral scientist and consultant who focuses on public health thank you today thank you keeping families safe in times of trouble children are the most vulnerable Jen Francis of Safe Families Canada talks about protecting kids at risk I use social media a lot, but I don't post a lot, so I'm not very active. And so I haven't found it too much of an issue of not posting, but I do find myself more cautious and like, if I post this photo, is it gonna be okay? Is there pressure Raising kids in a world of social media, what are the do's and don'ts? Plus, shout outs to the women that raised us. The Millennial Panel shares 
what they've learned from their own mothers. That's on contactswithlorna.com. Well, you've heard the term jack of all trades. Well, meet Jill. ER doctor, mom of four, world traveler, and media host. Sheldon Neal speaks with Dr. Rose Meter on the changing face of motherhood. Are you a super mom? People are going to watch this and say, how do you do this? This is incredible. If there's a secret in the sauce, it's, it's mothering first. Like all those things are extra. It's mothering first for sure. I mean, I've been a mom now for 13 years. My husband and I, we've taken on this parenting journey together. And so there's time I know what I need to do. I need my kids to be fed and secure and safe and develop their opportunities as well. And then outside and beyond that, to be a good mom, I do that for me too. And so I'm organized. I think that's probably my, my, my secret. How do you uh, account for this evolution of motherhood? My husband and I, we came into this with our heads clearly on our shoulders. We were going to do this together. And so we parent together. He does work full time, I work part time. I take on a little bit more of the domestic tasks and chores. Um, but at the hospital, we're both physicians. We respect each other. I delineate the task list and we have, it's practical tips too. We share an app <laughs> that lets him know what groceries to pick up at the store on his way home and what tasks and where the kids need to be and where they need to be picked up. And so I, I feel very supported and I have people around me that role model this too. How would you define motherhood? Motherhood is being strong inside myself to give myself away. I say the being strong inside myself first because just like we're advised in an airplane to fit your own oxygen mask first, I think it's a good analogy for motherhood. I know I need certain things in place for me to mother well. I actually need solid sleep. I need to take care of the basics. I need to have a good friendship support around me. I've got some mom friends and some girlfriends that fuel me. There's a discourse in society now with me, the Me Too movement and really genders trying to better understand each other and kind of work together uh, more recently in cell after the van attack in Toronto. How do you feel the dynamic to, do you feel men are trying to, are struggling with the understanding of motherhood and womanhood because it's somewhat tied together in a way? Incel and the talk of the motivation behind the van attack in Toronto, it angered me. And I can't believe it exists that there actually are some organized men that take that on and feel the need to act out because they've somehow been slighted or don't feel as though they've been able to be all they want to be. I, I'm, I'm angry by it. Um, God needs to move in a big and mighty way there. How does your faith uh, weave into your idea of what motherhood is? I, I have a Christian community. So our kids, my family, we've dug deep in our local church. It takes a village to raise my family. <laughs> so my kids get invested in with small group leaders on a Sunday morning. Um, other families that are also raising their kids with similar values. We're in a small group. We sometimes just talk our parenting struggles at our small group on a Wednesday evening. Wow. And, and then I do intentionally, with some discipline, carve out some quiet time, right? Like there will always be a way that God can minister to my mom heart and mind when I'm quiet and still and have everything else taken care of for the moment and can be fueled and energized and, and brought back to the foundation of just being loved as a person. Well, parents out there know there's times when you just need a break and a helping hand. Safe Families Canada has created a movement involving Christian families to put at-risk children into their homes for a short or long period of time. The goal to eventually be reunification with their parents in the long run. Jen Francis is the Executive Director of Safe Families Canada. She's here to join us today. Thanks for being here, Jen. Uh, Jen, we have about 50,000 kids in the foster system in Canada. The majority of those kids under the age of 14. Mm -hmm. Your program? Is, is trying to bypass that a little bit? 
We're trying to work on the prevention side of things okay. and help families early on so that they don't get to the point where their children would need to end up in the foster care system. And so how has this been working? Because it's relatively new to Canada, even though it's been in the States and the UK for a time being now. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's working really great here in Canada. We started small, but we are scaling up and we've had um, a really great success rate and a lot of interest in the program. And kids across the world, 35,000 have been placed into, into Christian homes, uh, an 85 percent return rate or higher than that. Yes. Uh, to tell me about how this has been working. I mean, this seems like an odd partnership because usually government covers things like this. Well, the government uh, actually responds after there's been incidences of abuse or neglect that have occurred. And so there isn't a large response or effort uh, trying to prevent those things from happening. So our program is unique in that way in that we're entirely focused on the prevention side. So we're trying to get to families where they're in a difficult situation, they have no social supports, and a crisis that they're facing could um, either lead to abuse or neglect or their children ending up in foster care. And so we intervene at that point. We take the kids, place them temporarily in a voluntary placement um, with with, with families we've recruited from local churches and gives the parent time to get back on their feet, resolve their crisis, and then the kids go back when the home is stable again. And what kind of crises are you seeing? I mean, what are the persistent problems for children here in Canada? Uh, the crises vary. It can be um, anything from like a, a medical hospitalization kind of thing to a drug addiction the parent needs to deal with or sudden homelessness or um, just an immigration issue. Um, the common thread that we're finding is that it's parents who are socially isolated. So they have no social support system. There's been maybe some kind of family breakdown or it's a result of, of migration or other factors that they don't have extended family, they don't have neighbors that they can lean on and who can help them um, in a time of crisis and who they can trust to care for their kids. And the difference here, Jenna, is that these are Christian families, these are people from churches that are stepping up. Mm -hmm. uh do those relationships continue? I mean, what, what has that been like? I mean, success on both ends of the stick here. Yes, yeah, so that is a big part of the goal of the program. We facilitate the placement of the kids with the Christian family and we oversee it, we screen them, we train them and all of that. But the goal is that they would build a relationship with that family so that even after the kids return to their parent, they're then reaching out, they're connecting with them so that that parent now has um, somebody to call. And we also have other volunteers from local churches that we will connect with that family so that in the long term, long term they have relationships um, that they can count on that they can trust in people who are going to be there for them. So we're trying to build that social safety net around people who don't have it. Is there a story that just touches your heart that you just, you know, can't get out of your mind when you think of this program? Uh, yeah, um, I'm just thinking of one mom that we had. We were called by a refugee center in Toronto. She would immigrated here. She was pregnant. She had a two-year-old and she was about to give birth. And so they called us to say, can you take her two-year-old while she's in the hospital giving birth? And so when I went to meet with her to make arrangements for that um, placement, I found out she was actually expecting twins. Mm -hmm. And she had just found out she was expecting twins and she was due to give birth any day. And she had nothing for the kids and she didn't know anything about the system. She didn't have health coverage yet, nothing. Um, and so not only were we able to take her two-year-old during the time that she was in the hospital giving birth, but we were able to outfit her with all of the material items that she needed um, for the twins. And then as once the twins were released into her care, uh, we were able to take her son multiple times in order to um, support her during that process of adjustment. And to this day, two years later, she's got a number of volunteers that still connect with her from Safe Amazing. Families and help her. And we know, I know from my work around refugees that specifically the ones that have primary contacts in the country, the ones that were most successful 10, 20, 30 years down the road. So amazing work that you guys do. Jen Francis, the Executive Director of Safe Families. You can find out more at safefamiliescanada.com. My mom and dad but, uh, taught myself as well as my three sisters that uh, as young women growing up in Canada into a home where we were loved and cared for that um, we had the kind of the world at our doorstep and that everything was possible. Uh, I think the, the message that we got from them was, you know, you can do whatever you want in this world. The only uh, parameters are is that you have to serve people, that you have to get out there and do something to make the world a better place. Such a beautiful sentiment and so many moms about service. Yeah. Sheldon, what's the greatest thing that your mom has taught you? You know, she's probably watching now, but I think the thing that I remember when I was about 12 or 13, she sat me down and said, Sheldon, learn to take stock of your life. Shut everything down and ask yourself the hard questions. Am I who I want to be? Am I where I want to be? And how do I cut it out if it's not helping me out? Goal setter. Uh, yeah, real <laughs> strong. I never forgot it. How about yourself? <laughs> um, my mom probably taught me sacrifice. Uh, oh, you know, she like was a really big career woman. And then my dad came into the picture and he travels 85% of the year. So to have a 
family. She stayed home for us after like three masters and two degrees, right? So it's just like that sacrifice is really, really huge. But I think there's a lot of families out there that, you know, maybe didn't have the birth mom, you know, have that connection, but there's so many women that step up. I love that older woman that you talked to the streeters. Yes, universal mother, she yeah, said. Yes. It's the universal motherhood. And so many of us have felt that in our lives. So right. thank you. Yes, it's a wonderful thing. We want, I, I, we want to check things out online. If you want to hear more, uh, even drop us a line so we can hear about things that have connected you and how mothers have been a big part of your life. Of course, check out that website, contextwithlorna.com. Also Facebook, Twitter, and keep the conversation going. We will see you next week.